Broadcasting Company presents The Magnificent Montague, starring Marty Woolley. In 1926, reviewing Edwin Montague's great performance in King Lear, Burns Mantle referred to him as the Magnificent Montague. Edwin never forgave Burns Mantle for that understatement. Today, still happily married to his one-time leading lady, Lily Boehm, Edwin Montague courageously remains true to his conviction that he is the world's greatest actor. In the last eight years, he's refused to act in any play in which he did not have the starring role. In the last eight years, he's refused to be in any drama in which he did not have the privilege of rewriting and directing personally. In the last eight years, he hasn't worked. But Edwin Montague knows that there will be a return of that golden era of the New York stage in Shakespeare. And when that time comes... By the way, the time right now is two in the afternoon, and we're in the Montague apartment. Okay, okay. Take it easy, you'll last longer. The residents of Edwin Montague and Miss Lily Bohem, they ain't up yet. Who knows when... They're actors. It could be ten minutes. It could be next Tuesday. <laughs> Who knows? Well, I'll take it, Agnes. Here, honey. Please get me some coffee. Hello, Charlie? Well, I really haven't asked Edwin yet. You see... Now, wait. Wait, Charlie. I promise I'll ask him as soon as he gets up. And what's more, you can tell them he'll take the job. Yes. Goodbye. Here's your coffee, honey. Agnes, what do you think? My husband, Edwin Montague, is going to work. You're kidding. No. <laughs> this is the end of one of the world's biggest nonprofit organizations. <laughs> Agnes, you'll see. He'll be easier to get along with. He'll be a changed man. Yeah, I guess so. Still, it was kind of fascinating watching him gracefully slide from unemployment insurance into Social Security. <laughs> so he found a play, huh? Well, it's not a play. He's going into radio. Agnes, my coffee. Oh, leave some dishes for him to smash when I tell him about it. Radio. And he doesn't know yet. Uh-uh. Agnes, a job will snap him out of this dream he has that he's still the foundation of the American theater. Otherwise, he'll spend the rest of his life sitting around the proscenium club with those broken-down hams. You mean the rest of the broken-down hams. Agnes, that'll be quite enough. The big matinee idol. The Sinatra of the 20s. The way he lords it around this house. Agnes, stop. The great Montague, the great windbag. Stop. The big actor. And all the time it was you who had more acting talent than he ever hoped to have. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> you know what, honey? What? You're a bigger ham than he is. <laughs> <laughs> I never doubted it. Oh, now, please, Agnes, no fights with him this morning. Everything has got to go right. Did you get his imported kippers? I could only get the domestic kippers. Oh, well. They're the same, aren't they? Identical. They taste the same, smell the same, feel the same. Good. But he'll know the difference. I never seen such a low life who lives so high. Agnes, please. English kippers, British clothes, imported shoes. What's he trying to do? Single handedly pull England out of the red? <laughs> Agnes, just this morning, don't say anything that will irritate him. He's up. Get his breakfast ready. He's doing his morning vocal exercises already. That means he's finished combing his beard. Oh, brother, he takes care of that beard like a chorus girl with her first mink. <laughs> now we'll start roaming the hills. I roam the hills. <laughs> quick, quick, Agnes, here he comes. Good morning, Edwin. <laughs> Sit down. I roam the hills. Good morning, Lily. He made it. Uh, good morning, Agnes I see you got here this morning I suppose you arrived by your usual means of transportation A broom <laughs> Edwin, please It's such a beautiful day And I must say you look so, so dashing this morning, doesn't he, Agnes? Oh, I think he's a dream <laughs> Agnes <laughs> Agnes, my dear Agnes, it is a little early to start debating our respective beauty. All I can say is that after 25 years of having to look at your face before eating breakfast, there can be but one epitaph on my tombstone. Edwin Montague, 
he had a strong stomach. <laughs> please, now, please, no quarrels. Look, Edwin, Agnes fixed your breakfast just the way you like it. Well, there must be a first time. <laughs> Here, Edwin, your raw egg and Worcestershire sauce, kippered herring, a broiled veal kidney, two mutton chops rare, and old gratin potatoes. The breakfast of champions. Excellent. <laughs> now, uh, you go ahead and eat, Edwin. <laughs> Oh, uh, by the way, Charlie Foster telephoned this morning. Oh? Uh, um, mm. He feels that he has at last found the most... Oh. Oh. What's the matter? Domestic kippers. Edwin! Domestic kippers, what is this place becoming? A white tower? <laughs> this is another of Agnes's attempts to poison me. Look at that kipper. It looks off. What do you think the kipper's thinking about, looking up at you? <laughs> Now, listen, Miss Housemaid's knee of 19 or two. If you... Edwin, we couldn't get imported kippers this morning. Now, uh, will you please let me go on? Sorry, dear. Go on. How about Charlie, yeah? Now, I, uh, I don't want you to be shocked. Shocked? <laughs> Nothing could shock me after that excitement we had at the Proscenium Club last night. We had to drum Cecil Banks out of the organization. Oh, poor old Cecil. What did he do? We found out Cecil's going into radio. Radio? Yes, ra uh, d please don't make me repeat that word again. Cecil Banks, another deserter of the theater. I was up until three in the morning striking out all reference to him in my memoirs. <laughs> another name gone. Radio, better to dig ditches than that. <laughs> oh, now, what's this about Charlie uh, Foster? Well, Edwin, uh, Charlie Foster has a job for you. The starring role. I knew it. I knew it. They finally found a Juliet for me. It's not Romeo and Juliet. It's not? Oh. No. You see, this job that Charlie has for you is... Imagine, the... in all New York, they can't find a Juliet. Ah, if you only hadn't let yourself go, but... But continue, darling. Tell me about the job. Well... Edwin, what did you mean by if I just hadn't let myself go? <laughs> oh, now, Lily, I didn't mean your looks or your going to seed or anything like that. Well, just what did you mean? Well, I meant, uh, I meant, well, you found new interests. Every afternoon, you're, you're busy as secretary of the women's bird watchers of America. That's all I meant. Oh. Why, Lily, honey... You're still as charming and as captivating as the day I first picked you out of the chorus of the naughty little princess and made you my leading lady. <laughs> now, what about this job? Edwin, I honestly don't want to bring this up again. But once and for all, it's got to be settled between us. I was not in the chorus of the naughty little princess. I was the star. Oh, no, not that again. And you didn't pick me to be your leading lady. David Belasco had to talk me into it. You were known as the worst scene stealer on the American stage. I, a scene stealer? Let's face it, darling. I spent five years on the stage with you before I knew there was an audience. You so gallantly hid it from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's how you felt. This, then, is my penalty for loving an envious woman. Envious? I never envied you, Edwin. I stood aside as you took your bows. I was content and happy. But in all decency, allow me the memory. The memory of the little success that I did have. Say that again. The whole thing? <laughs> no, 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 just the, just the end. Uh, but allow me the memory of the little success. That I did have. Gad, what a reading. What resonance and fire. Oh, Lily, you've still got it, old girl. You've still got it. Bravo, oh, bravo. Oh, stop it, both of them. <laughs> Go ahead, darling. Anything you want me to do. Just Anything? Yes. Strike while the iron's hot. Uh, Edwin, <clears throat> this job Charlie has for you is, of course, the starring role. Yes. Well, what is it? An afternoon radio program. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I have a pretzel in the oven. Agnes, stay here. It had to be my own wife who said that. It couldn't have been a stranger. A stranger I could strangle, crush, and trample into the ground for suggesting that I, Edwin Montague, go into radio. But Edwin... Silence! Edwin Montague in radio? Never! Not as long as there is breath in my body. Well, you'd better have breath in your body, because unless you get a job, there'll be no food in it. <laughs> you mean our money is gone? Darling, what do you think I've been using for the last eight years to pay for your imported kippers? 
Your imported cigar, Ben? Now, this radio job... Radio? No, I'll dig ditches first. Edwin, what is this newfound confidence you have in digging ditches? <laughs> the only time you ever held a shovel was in the play Hill of Gold, and then on opening night you used the wrong end. <laughs> Anything but radio. My friends at the Presidium Club will, will, will stone me. The Shalimar Soap Company will pay $200 a week. No one will know it's you. There will be absolutely no publicity. Oh, no, Lily, I can't. Not radio. That's what killed the stage. Oh, nonsense. If I must sell soap, let me at least maintain my pride and do it from door to door. <laughs> Edwin, are you going to take the job? To be or not to be... That is the problem. That is the question. That is the question. Whether Edwin, tis... Edwin, yes or no? Well? No one will know it's me. Nobody. Of course, you know, if the news leaks out that I'm in radio, I shall automatically commit suicide. Naturally. Well, Edwin? Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt and resolve itself. Thaw and resolve itself. Thaw and... Edwin, Edwin, are you going to take the job? To be or not to be. Edwin, it pays $200 a week. The starring role? You play a character called Uncle Goodheart. Uncle? (laughs) Death, where is thy sting? Well, Edwin... Yes or no? I must bow to the fates. Yes. Edwin, I'm proud of you. I'll call Charlie. Please. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll retire to my study where I'm going to make the final revision on my memoirs. I am going to strike my own name out of it. <laughs> Have you the orange juice? Got it. Black coffee? It's all here. You're sure it's eight o'clock? It's five after. You gonna wake him up? <sighs> here goes. Edwin, darling, time to get up and go to the radio station for your first program. <clears throat> Try again. Put some beef in it. <laughs> Edwin, darling, it's time to get up. <clears throat> Help me out, Agnes. Okay, you take one ear, I'll take the other. Let's go. Edwin, darling, it's time to get up. (laughs) Wait, 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 he's stirring. What's happened? What is it? Time to get up, darling. It's eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock? God, I've I've overslept. No, dear, you don't understand. It's eight o'clock in the morning. (laughs) Morning? Well, that's ridiculous. Look, it's, it's dark. The sun shines in the morning. I read that in a book somewhere. (laughs) Now, sit up, sweetheart. Agnes, the black coffee. Right. I hope it's still hot. It is. Here. All right. Now, Edwin, this coffee... Edwin? Edwin? Come on, Agnes. Edwin, Edwin, darling, it's time time to get up. (laughs) Oh, Lily, this is ridiculous. Why, even as a baby, I never got up until noon. (laughs) Now, just drink this coffee, sweet. Lily, I I can't be seen at this hour. They'll think I'm a burglar. (laughs) And you have to be at the studio at nine. Now, no more nonsense. Agnes, the brown suit, a white shirt and brown tie. Coming up. Now the shoes and socks. Here, honey. Thank you. All right, Edwin, you dress what... Edwin? Once more, Agnes. Edwin, darling, it's It's time time to get up. All right, I'm up. Tonight is the night for the return of Duffy's Tavern. Your host will be the ungrammatical Archie played by Ed Gardner. Duffy won't be there as usual, but he will be represented by his undeniably charming daughter, Miss Duffy. Clifton Finnegan and Eddie the Waiter will also be on hand to join in the mischief which Archie will undoubtedly cook up. The chimes are your invitation to top Friday evening listening later tonight with Duffy's Tavern over most of these NBC stations. And a reminder, this Sunday on NBC, it's the big show once again, an hour and a half of the best in comedy, music, and drama. (laughs) 
And now let's listen to the magnificent Montague at his first radio rehearsal. Hold it, cast. Before I start directing you in the first rehearsal of Uncle Goodhart, Mr. Springer, our head of production, would like to say a few words. Mr. Springer. Thank you, Mr. Zinzar. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be brief. Our sponsor is the Shalimar Soap Company. We go on the air directly opposite our biggest competitor's program, Aunt Agatha. Our program, Uncle Goodhart, must be a weapon. A weapon that will strike so hard, so true, that it'll wipe Aunt Agatha off the air lanes. It's up to you. Carry on. <laughs> okay, Cass, let's rehearse it right uh, from uh, the... Uh, excuse me, but isn't this all a waste of time? A waste of time, Mr. Yes, Montague? before rehearsal, I'd like to take a few weeks to work out the character and sit with the writers and develop... A, a... few weeks to... Mr. Montague, this program goes on the air in half an hour. Half an hour? You mean every week I have... Every week? Five times a week. Five times? Oh, not with me, you don't. What am I, a jukebox? <laughs> Mr. Montague, this is radio. What's you... up? What's up? Any trouble? Oh, nothing, Mr. Springer. This is Mr. Edwin Montague, our Uncle Goodhart. Now, how do you do? I was explaining certain things to Mr. Montague. He's new in radio. What? You in radio? Zinza, for the leading role on a program as important as this, you use an unknown amateur? An unknown amateur? Why, you filthy little... Mr. Montague, this filthy little... I mean, this is Mr. Springer, the producer who... Zinza, I demand... But, Mr. Springer, Mr. Montague is one of the great actors of the legitimate stage. It was a stroke of sheer luck to get him as Uncle Goodhart. Oh? Sorry I offended you, old man. Hmm. Personally, I never go to plays. I always say, give me the movies. You see the best actors and they let you smoke in the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> the movies. My dear sir, it's men with brains like yours that make morons overconfident. Rehearsal. Okay, Cass, let's go. No music, just a dry run. Bartley and Melissa drive up. Sound. That must be the cottage over there, Bartley. Do you think he's home? Oh, he's got to be. It's our only hope. Oh, look. That must be he coming to meet us. Hello, Uncle Goodhart. Hello, and bless you. Hold my... it. Mr. Montague, you were off mic. Off mic? Yes. <laughs> Please speak into the microphone. Thank you, but I don't use the microphone. Yes. <laughs> Let's take it from... Uh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Montague. I said I don't use a microphone. You don't use a microphone? <laughs> and my good man, this may seem strange to you, but I come from an era of the theater where an actor's voice did not need the aid of these artificial doodads in order to be heard. My voice projection is famous, you know. But, Mr. Montague... Never! <laughs> the voice that has shaken the very last rose over his theater in New York refuses to be party to this mechanical subterfuge. Mr. Montague, radio... Never, never. Now, 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 what's the trouble? Oh, nothing, Mr. Springer. It's just that Mr. Montague doesn't want to use the microphone. Well, now, now, if he doesn't want to use the... <laughs> he doesn't want to use the microphone. <laughs> He doesn't want to use the microphone. I assure you I can be heard without a microphone. How about the people in Denver? Zinzer, I hold you personally responsible. Please, Mr. Montague. Ever since I saw you in Macbeth when I was just a child, you've been my idol. Please trust me when I say in radio you have to speak into a microphone. Well, very well. So you saw me in Macbeth, eh? Remember this? I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and be baited with a rabble's curse. I throw my warlike shield. Lay on, Macduff! Eh? Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful, wasn't it, Mr. Springer? Zinza, remember when I said without a microphone they wouldn't hear him in Denver? Yeah. I think he could do it. 
Yeah, but we'd better get on. Uh, Mr. Montague, we'll take it from where Melissa and Bartley approach you. Page five. Page five. Uh, oh, here it is. <clears throat> Uh, that must be the cottage over there, Bartley. Do you think he's home? Oh, he's got to be. It's our only hope. Oh, look. That must be he coming to meet us. Hello, Uncle Goodhart. Hello, and bless you, my children. Why, as I live and breathe, if it isn't Zeke Chickering's little girl, Melissa. Oh, Uncle Goodhart. And mercy be, child, for the way you're blushing. I'll bet this tall, good-looking fellow with you is your beau. Now, fess up. <laughs> Please, Mr. Montague. Uh, yes, I, I should very much like to meet the writer of this epic. I've never seen, I, I've never seen a three-year-old operate a typewriter before. <laughs> Please, Mr. Montague, we're trying to get a timing. Your line, Bartley. I am Bartley Boswell, Uncle Goodhart, Doc Boswell's son. Oh, Uncle Goodhart. Something terrible has happened. Bartley and I can't get married. <laughs> now come, come, child. We, we must look at the sunny side. Hold it. Mr. Montague, you'll have to speed that up a little. Speed it up. Yeah. <laughs> when you see me twirl my index finger like this, it means speed it up. Your index finger. Uh, Mr. Zinzer, I am an actor, not an orchestra. <laughs> and I refuse, I refuse to be conducted like a three-piece band. I shall read it as I feel it, and you keep your finger out of it. <laughs> but, but, Mr. Montague, the character... Young man, are you telling me, Edwin Montague, how to read a character? All I would... You, you, a radio director... The lowest point a man can sink to and still stay out of jail for vagrancy. <laughs> you dare to do what even the great Velasco never presumed to do? Tell Edwin Montague how to play a character? One minute to our time. Oh, one minute. Mr. Montague, the script is time for a certain speed. You must fit into it. I fit into this anthology of cliches. It must fit into me. <laughs> Zinzer, get rid of this troublemaker. I'm going. 30 seconds. Where's my hat? Mr. Montague, we're going on the air. It's a gray Hamburg with a green feather. <laughs> Sabotage! That's what it is. Mr. Montague, you can't walk out. I won't. I'll run. <laughs> Shalimar Soap brings you Uncle Goodhart. He was sent here by Saperoni Soap. He's a dirty spy. Oh, you spied. I'll pull your nose off and let the air out of your head. <laughs> Quiet, please. Quiet, we find gentle, kind, lovable Uncle Goodhart <laughs> seated on the steps of his little vine-covered cottage, waiting to give comfort and counsel to the weary traveler. Listen. Since uh, the show's begun, Mr. Montague, do the character any way you want to. Any way? <laughs> Very well. That must be the cottage over there, Bartley. Do you think he's home? Oh, he's got to be. It's our only hope. Oh, look. That must be he coming to meet us. Hello, Uncle Goodhart. Your cue, Mr. Montague, your cue. Here's your script. Who needs a script? <laughs> Hello, and bless you, my children, why, as I live and breathe. If it isn't Zeke Chickering's little saber-toothed offspring, Melissa. <laughs> and without a leash... <laughs> oh, no. I'll kill him. I'll shoot him down in cold blood. Why, uh, um, Uncle Goodhart, you remember me. Only because you're absolutely impossible to forget. <laughs> and who is this with you? This creature with the pre-shrunk head. <laughs> I'm Bartley Boswell, Uncle Goodhart, the, the Doc Boswell's son. Oh, Uncle Goodhart, something terrible has happened. Bartley and I can't get married. Well, uh, I don't know which one of you to congratulate first. 
uh, still, it it would have been an extraordinary match. <laughs> Get back, Mr. Springer! Let go of me, Sinter! Let me at him! Yes! Agnes, that sounds awful. What else did he say on the program? Then he tells us Bartley and Miss Melissa there's only one solution for their problem. Get married, buy a little home, move in, and turn on the gas. <laughs> turn on the gas? Oh, so help me. At the end of the show, they made an announcement. The ideas expressed on this program are not necessarily those of any human being. <laughs> I'm so afraid something's happened to him. It's been an hour since his program was over. Maybe he's in jail. There must be a law against what he did to the air. Agnes, this is no time. Shh, here he comes. Edwin, what happened? Well, it's been over an hour since... Sorry I'm late, dear. I, I had to keep circling and backtracking to shake them off my trail. Well, the phone's been ringing continually. A Mr. Zinzer and a Mr. Springer have been trying to get you. Lily, you didn't tell them where we live. Now, Edwin... I think Springer carries a gun. <laughs> I saw him reaching for something as he lunged at me when I ran out of the studio. Well, he should have caught you. I was at the bird watcher's office, but Agnes heard the program. The whole thing? The whole thing. Even... <laughs> Even... <laughs> oh, Lily, after what I did to it, radio can never recover. The theater shall live again. Oh, Agnes, there's someone at the door. Edwin, how could you have done... I struck a blow for the theater. I stand here brave and unafraid. It's the Mr. Zinkin and Mr. Springer. Lily, Lily, you, you have to hide me. Uh, show the gentleman in. This way, boys. Check your hardware. Mr. <laughs> now, look Mr. here, Springer, Montague. the man who brought you up the elevator is a Golden Gloves champ. I can have him here in two seconds. Mr. Montague, if you wish me to crawl at your feet, command me. Crawl at my feet? Mr. Montague, will you ever forgive my horrible presumption in trying to tell you, the master, how to play a character? What is this? If you wish me to kiss your boots, command me. Look, if you came up here just to make love to my feet, you're with me. <laughs> Mr. Montague, the moment Uncle Goodhart went off the air, the telephone switchboard at the station lit up like a Christmas tree. Listeners all over the country are still calling to tell us at last a real down-to-earth character has been heard on radio. A real... Why, man, you hit the nation with the impact of a howitzer. I did. How could we have been so blind? It was you with your unerring dramatic sense who knew that the public wanted a contrast to the sweet, kindly, sentimental, old homey radio characters. You gave them something new. A salty, down-to-earth, real, living Uncle Goodhart. It's the greatest thing since just plain Bill. <laughs> Uh, just plain who? <laughs> One man telephoned all the way from Council Bluffs, Iowa, just to say, yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> it's sweeping the country. Gad. <laughs> Come, Zinza. We must let Uncle Goodhart rest so he can reach new heights in tomorrow's episode. See you in the morning, Mr. Montague. Silly, they're crazy. They're madmen. People listen to that horrible thing I did and... And they liked it. The magnificent Montague does it again. What have I done? What have I done? Well, whatever you did, dream boy, keep doing it. It means imported kippers from now on. Lily, you've missed the whole point. The whole point? Yes, it just struck me. There I was doing my best to be bad, and I couldn't. I couldn't. What came out was great. Well, of course. Lily, I suspected it for many years, but now at last I know. I am truly magnificent. Tune in next week and find out what happens when the magnificent Montague and radio meet head on. Remember, next week, same time, same station, it's the magnificent Montague starring Monty Woolley, created and written by Nat Hyken. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.